Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here for our session, Real Power is Soft Power, Philanthropy in Art and Culture. I'm delighted to have three amazing friends and experts in this field, Firoza Godrej, Kiran Mazumdar, and Sunil Mujar. Thank you for being here and listening to us. Uh, during COVID, it was the arts that, the, that millions of us have turned to for comfort, relief, and respite. With contesting priorities in a developing country, the significance of arts and culture in stimulating conversations, driving economic growth, fostering community cohesion, and a soft power is often ignored. Why do we need to change that perception without any more delay? What role can corporate support play and why should we all care? This is the subject of this afternoon's discussion. Piroza Ji, I'd like to start with you. You have been running Simroza for, I think now exactly 50 years. You've been involved with the CSMBS, INTAC, NGMA, Bhavdaji Lad, the Museum Society of Bombay, the Godridge Archives. You seem to have had a life that has been totally immersed in art and culture. Could you please share how this has changed you and played a part in making you the person that you are today? Thank you very much for that question. But before I answer you, I would really like to thank you for having me on this session. And it's a pleasure to be with uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, I'm joined by Kiran and Sunil. And uh, it's going to be a challenge to keep up to everybody's expectations, but I shall try to do my best. Um, what keeps me going is uh, I'm always enthusiastic about what I do. I have a great passion for it, and uh, it's not a boast, but I sincerely do devote a lot of my time to all these institutions in a very genuine way. By, uh, not, it's not just a philanthropic support, because to write a check, in my opinion, is hard in COVID times, I agree, but uh, it's one of the easiest things that corporates can do, and sometimes it's just to sort of a balm on your conscience, you know, that I've given the money. But to actually be there organizing things and getting the show off the ground, so to speak, is a tough job. And even tougher still, Abhishek, is finding talent and good talent. And talent for fi to find talent over the last five decades has been difficult, but it's been a real pleasure. Because for me, I've grown up with all the people who are the who's who today in the art world. So that's what keeps me going. That's what gives me a lot of strength and support. And uh, I'll end there now because I know time is short. Thank you, Firoza Ji. Sunil Bhai, you started the Serendipity Festival and it's become such an institution and it's been on the country's cultural calendar, something we all look forward to visiting each year. It's done a lot of work with respect to art and economic viability and sustainability, from mentoring artists to facilitating collaborations between local artisans and architects in Goa. Can you please tell us a little bit about why this is relevant? Um, so I think this is a question that we, each one of us need to ask ourselves every now and then as to what is it that we really do with our time here? What is it that we leave behind? Because very often we've, we've heard the term of tread lightly on this planet and things like we have borrowed this planet from our future generation. The reality is the quality of life that we have lived on this planet over the last 200 years has actually impacted the planet fairly negatively. The saving grace is the impact that has taken place on the softer aspects of things like art and culture. You have organizations which are going and supporting development of greening the planet. But when it comes to people, when it comes to us as humanity, I think it is critical that we appeal a little bit to our soul. And exactly as Pirola said, Arts are a language which speaks, it's a universal language of the soul. 
and if it is to be encouraged if it is to grow it has to find sustainability therefore the economic viability also becomes critical for us to continue to encourage this it also needs patrons specialists um and funders of the kind that we have on this panel these two ladies are amazing supporters uh, of the arts as are you so i think it's it's important that each one of us plays a role as that we can and try and reach out beyond ourselves to both enhance and propagate the presence and the possibilities of the arts and culture thank you if i may ask you this next question is when it is so important why is corporate india doing so little in this sector so uh, unfortunately corporate india has never seen this i shouldn't say never has mostly not seen this as one of their priorities they have been focused on a whole host of other things and in the last 20 or 30 years you have started seeing a slight shift from corporates and senior executives to support such activities the reality is that worldwide things like research museums healthcare uh, education not just survive but also thrive if they get the right support and patronage in india sadly that has not been the case the support and funding has gone a little bit to education and some to healthcare these are areas which are now beginning to get attention and that's i shouldn't say that no one has ever done it after all you know there are people like you uh, who who have been supporting these uh, these activities for a while but i think the realization is only now coming in that what we call soft power the distinction between hard and soft power has started to get made now to my mind we need to focus on smart power which empowers people and for that you have to have a good balance of hard power and soft power and the soft power piece is what comes in from support to communities who are focused on arts culture artisanal skills as also keeping back of the historic perspective of where we come from and therefore what are our artistic anchors i'm going to stop here i, I can speak for a long time on this but i i, I know you have three of us <laughs> thank you sunil bhai kiran uh you talked and this is the perfect time to ask you this question you've talked enough about creative expression being at the heart of both science and art and these are both causes that you hold dear and have been supporting can you please share with us why this is important from the perspective of education and the workplace thanks uh, abhishek for having me uh, on this panel i i think it's going to be a very interesting discussion because i want to uh, you know borrow from the statements made by both feroza and sunil you know we talk about patrons of art and yet we should be investing in art i think uh, sunil talked about the fact that we don't invest enough in research art etc etc and i completely agree with him because creativity expression and the kind of uh, knowledge that comes out of that kind of investment is very very important for the soul of a nation if you want to build our country into what we all aspire to see it we cannot compartmentalize knowledge into arts and science <clears throat> after all arts and science are intertwined you know you and i have had many many such discussions there is something called the art of science and the science of art okay i mean today if you look at any piece of great art there is so much of science in it how you know physics plays such an important role in just scattering light rays in the way it's depicted in paintings similarly when you think about designing an experiment looking at data i mean for instance uh dna uh you know the the whole structure of dna was actually interpreted from a very artistic point of view as to why it should be the way it is and why does it behave the way it is so there's a lot of intricacy and intimacy between art and science 
and if we start compartmentalizing it we actually destroy the creativity and as a scientist i have always embedded art in everything i do so there is what is genuinely uh, you know described as the art of science and for me i think as a country we need to make sure that we don't keep patronizing quote and quote the arts but invest in it invest in science invest in research if we don't think of it as an investment but if we think of it as philanthropy and patronage i really don't think we will actually uh, draw anything out of either the arts or the sciences that's our flaw that's why our education is very flawed because we are too compartmentalized in the way we think about knowledge i'll end there I, I want to get on here uh, for a moment. Uh, sure. This is because Kiran has, has has raised a very interesting point. Interestingly, education, which was had such an amazing single-minded focus on what we call STEM education over the last fifty years, this focus on science and technology and maths, is now transforming itself to what we call STEAM education. They've actually added arts into this STEM thing, and uh, we ourselves actually just taken on a, a full program. that we've launched in ludhiana for same education and and this i think will be a perfect combination of the arts and science because they do have a symbiotic relationship you in fact took the question that i was going to ask next so sorry <laughs> building up on that you know we were just doing a little survey in india and to see that we have 14 and a half thousand courses and colleges for engineering and 15 for art another shocking number was there are only about 80 expert trained restoration people in the country mm -hmm. i mean this is staggering for a country of our size and what needs to be done over here is i mean whatever we can do is less uh firoza ji asking you again uh tell me uh the legacy that you would like to leave behind i mean i must uh, confess here to everybody who's listening these three are not just great friends of mine they have all also been supporting an initiative that i'm involved in the museum of art and photography but firoza ji you have supported every endeavor when it comes to the arts and what is the real legacy you would like to be remembered by Well, Abhishek, I've never really looked at it as a legacy that I want to leave behind. And whereas I know that uh, Kiran and Sunil have both talked about education, I think they're referring to higher education. Uh, I would like to go a notch below that, and I'm really looking at primary education. We have such a condescending attitude towards the arts. when our children are in primary school we are delighted to go to all that concerts etc but even parents feel that you should be doing the stem and not the steam and that is changing and i think it's changing in a very big way because there have been so many iconic successes in the field of sport in the field of tourism in the field of restoration in the field of painting i mean all of us who are here know what the auctions are doing and um, i don't subscribe to everything but uh, the auction houses and the way they promoted the artists uh, those who gone ahead of us didn't see the benefit of their work for, in monetary gains but uh, parents are thinking wow these are professions that are open to our children if they can't do the normal engineering medicine law uh, it and i feel that i would really if there is a legacy i really want everybody everybody in the country whether they're in a rural area an urban area uh, an agrarian area to invest in their children in a holistic way even if you are a farming community there is so much creativity around you in your everyday utensils in your everyday approach to your uh, schooling etc and if that comes in i know we'll require at least two generations and i think we're well on our way to that i can say that quite uh, quite um, emphatically 
then we will be creating, we won't be having these debates about real power and soft power. It will be a natural progression that this is the way we develop, whether it's in music and look at the music we have, look at the craft that we have. I, it's absolutely astounding, but it starts right there. It doesn't end in primary school. The concerts are over. The costumes have been put away. The little headdresses are over. No, it's the beginning and it must continue. And you're absolutely right. When I say soft power in the arts, I know that here we're very invested into uh, painting, sculpture, drawing, etc., etc. But what about dramatics? What about theater? I'm not talking only about film, which is a great attraction for everybody. Everybody aspires to be on the big screen. But many have aspirations to be on the stage. And the amount of things that come in, history comes in, literature comes in, costume designing come in. I mean, we have one Bhanu Athaya who wins an Oscar. You know, when, what, what, so this is what I feel. There are many things you can do uh, with your, uh, of course, I'm not even going to mention that uh, later on, politics, which hems us in with our borders, art opens up those soft powers. We can, uh, we can commune, we can communicate with people across our borders and far beyond our borders with this soft, soft power which we call art. If there is a legacy and if one, all three of us, I'm sure you will agree, this is what we want to see sure. before it's too late. It won't, it won't, it's never too late. I think we're on the right path. We just take a little time. Thank you, Firozaji. Just to give you a statistic that also got highlighted again this year, the money that goes into art and culture under our Ministry of Culture and what India as a country spends, this is for close to 970, 80 government museums that we run in the country, all our archaeological sites, all our cultural festivals, everything to do with art, theatre, dance, music, literature, archaeology, is only $9 million more than the budget of the Metropolitan Museum. One museum in New York and India's budget for all this. So it's, real, it's really high time that we realize this. We are one of the oldest cultures in the world. We have some of the most amazing artworks in our museums, the most crowded cities in the world, but the most empty museums. Uh, Sunil Bhai, asking you the next one. You've often spoken about India losing 1% of our heritage every year over the last 35 odd years. Why is this so? And what needs to be done to reverse this trend? I think there are two aspects to this, uh, One is, and this is, by the way, it came out of a study done by Dasra a few years ago, which actually mm. did the survey research and then documented this in a report which talked about this percentage a year of our cultural heritage getting lost. Uh, the reason it needs to be taken care of is twofold. One is because this is our heritage and we are losing it at the cost of jumping blindly to what we see as the Western way of doing things. You know, we, we actually taught the world most of these things, which, which we are now trying to ape from other, other parts of the world. The second is for sheer practical economic reasons. If you can revive some of these artisanal skills and contemporize those skills, make the products, crafts, products relevant in today's communities, markets, uh, and, and make it desirable. And by the way, it's, it's doable, doable. You have the potential to create 100 plus million jobs. What is happening today is because these are no longer viable, uh, many, and these are all, knowledge is transmitted generation to generation, always orally. Many young people in the villages where most of this resides are saying, I'm going to go to the next town and become a sales girl or join a call center or a bank or etc. So just get up and leave. Even the parents are encouraging them to go. So that skill gets lost forever because there's no documentation of this. So one on the one hand, you lose a skill permanently. Second, you, these young boys and girls are going in to a crowded place, both physically and the job market. So you're actually not, not creating the kind of multiplier effect that we need to for our own people. 
because we have, as, as you heard, uh, all both of the speaker and yourself saying one of the most amazing cultural heritage in the world. I don't need to tell you or the audience here. Uh, we have a richer heritage than any 10 countries put together. And surely it is declining. There's just no doubt. So there is every reason and every logic for us to focus on this, at least, at least try and stem this, if not actually turn this around. And it's good because we've done some experiments. We've tried it and tested it across the country. We've done over, I don't know the exact number now, probably over 100 experiments in different places. A majority of them actually work. If you just contemporize the knowledge of materials, colors, packaging, you know, things of that nature, uh, which make it easier to, to bring these products to the, to, to the market today. You know, um, when we are talking about corporate India, and most of the people listening to us are from corporate India, uh, the CSR budget that corporate India has, which roughly totals about two, $2 billion a year now, and it's less than a 10 year phenomenon, it's about 0.8% that goes towards art, culture, and heritage. That's a 0.81% to be exact. How do we make this a sexy sector? for everybody to look at investing in. Because uh, the reason I think most people don't even think about it is either it's considered fuddy-duddy or it's not considered important. So you, you don't need something like a pandemic to happen for healthcare to become important. So we don't need to get this into extinction for people to realize how important it is. What can we do as corporate India to bring the spotlight and the focus on why this is so important right now. I think you raise a very important point. It is about messaging and communication. It's not that we don't know, but it's useful to remind ourselves every now and then and bring this up in our list of priorities because the others are also priorities. I, I, I can't run down things that the need for education to get improved exactly as Firoza said, right from the primary level is critical. The need for healthcare to, to shape up and be accessible and available quality healthcare to, to all Indians is, is absolutely critical. So is this. This is as important for us as, as individuals and communities. And, and I guess they should visit more places like your museum or like the Serendipity Arts Festival. But since all of you have been there, you would have seen the, the projects that were done by just contemporizing existing skills to make products that are, that are uh, useful and desirable in, in today's markets. I'm using a little bit of commercial language, but it is necessary to do that, to, to uh, highlight the, the amazing possibilities that, that lie in our own cultural uh, heritage and our artisanal skills. They are absolutely amazing. And no matter which area you look at, woodwork, uh, you know, bell metals and in, in leather, and literally across the board, our textile, such a rich uh, offering is available. But not a lot of this actually gets to people who consume and use these. I would like to add to that by saying that, look, I think if you look at the way we go about our heritage, you know, understanding what our, uh, the value of our culture and heritage is all about, I don't think we've engaged enough with the people, with the communities. We have made museums very exclusive spaces. We have not made them inclusive. I don't think there's been an outreach. I don't think we've really done enough to basically make people understand how important soft power is. And I think that's where it all stems from, Abhi. I personally believe that corporate India today will spend billions of dollars on design thinking. What is design thinking? If you don't understand the aesthetics and the, you know, the creativity that goes into even simple things like come out with a strategy, then, you know, you, you, you cannot do good justice to that if you don't understand what, you know, art is all about. I really believe it all starts with that. You look at an ad and you say, wow, what a wonderful ad or what an aesthetic piece of uh, advertisement. All that actually stems from the fact that the creative Aspects of that design are coming from artists who are behind the scenes. So I think you need to understand that India has a lot to offer to the world, but we ourselves don't realize the value of what we have. And I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's not about India versus the West or borrowing from the West. You first have to just basically 
appreciate and value what you have i don't think you need to really sort of keep uh, blaming it on borrowing ideas from the west i think you have enough ideas within you but you're not ideating enough and i personally believe like what piroza said it doesn't just stop at uh, the uh, uh, you know the the uh, the art and uh, painting and sculpture and we need to look at the performing arts the performing arts is extremely important and in fact if i may say so covid actually gave all of us around the world to pause and appreciate a lot of art in our world in our lives okay i for one i think i have learned so much about art i mean this morning i was looking at the terracotta temples hmm. and i was looking at how beautiful they are and how wonderfully they've been uh, built and i'm just thinking to myself i don't even know half of what i have in my country right i know a very microscopic bit of what my country has because we haven't bothered to discover our country we haven't bothered to discover our heritage because we are so caught up in this uh, very high paced world and th- this world is all about j- being very materialistic very focused on just getting on in life and not bothering about the softer parts of our lives or finding our soul that is a fact every today i think everywhere in the world people are stepping back and saying let's see what the world has to offer us and it's not about their own countries i think they're looking everywhere and today i would say beauty is there in every part of the world you know when you know you might find some gems in your country but you'll also find gems in other countries so i this is the time for us to cross borders to collaborate to to blend and you know uh, bring, bring about a melange of uh, cultural ideas and you know cultural creativity so kiran yes. it sounds as if you read our documents because we are actually doing doing planning to do exactly that you're setting up a new project which has all of these components in it and more yeah, it's a very ambitious project Yes, go ahead, Firoz. Sorry, Firoz. Yeah, I'd like to say something. If I could see who our audience were, I would really ask for this poll. <laughs> I have done this, you know, uh, especially in the last fifteen, uh, sixteen years, when Kiran, our CSM VS Museum, really brought a blockbuster to India called the Mummy, and from the British Library, British Museum, and I asked so many from the corporate world. The show was on for three months. and they hadn't even been to see the exhibition so then i started asking please tell me when was the last time you went to your local museum hmm. oh when we were in school when was the last time you went to a museum abroad oh we went to the met we went to the bm we went to the louvre we went to the prado and i said well, why not to our museum and on the last day i begged some techy people I said please come to this show can you not spare 40 minutes of your time before you go to work and see how technology has unraveled this mummy it was a fantastic eye opener they didn't have to take anything off the mummy except the wooden case in which we find these mummies and you could go through you could look they portrayed the whole a uh, blood stream they could tell you whether it was a male mummy or a female mummy they could say whether it had died of a femoral break without touching the object it was brilliant and i'm glad some people were roused to go and see the local museum wherever your museum you don't have to wait for a blockbuster to come but just go and see it and then of course go and see the museums overseas ceramic museums in japan are beautiful you talked about terracotta our terracotta temples in india are fantastic and the last thing i want to say you know there's this feeling that corporates and government are going to be at loggerheads asi feels the monument is theirs and i keep on saying the monument is ours it is ours please we are not marauders we are coming there to devour our culture please let us into your storehouses if not into your storehouses bring things on display many museums have so much in storage and very little on display of their collection so this mindset that you know the public and the government the government institute yes you know this should go now 
they should yeah. go and we one, one, Abhishek one, and I are already used to this because I think we were trying to restore museums in Bangalore and there was this huge public outcry by none other than artists themselves who accused us of wanting to usurp and steal away the museums from them. <laughs> you know, Kiran, this has happened in libraries. The libraries collecting dust run by trusts and the manuscripts, priceless manuscripts are crumbling. What is this? You know, we have to change I, I, our I think, uh, Firoza, you raise an important point. So it, it needs a little bit of thinking. How do we change the relationship? Just one sense. Museum yeah. collections and people. You know, Sunil, I want yes. to make one more point and I want you to continue. Yeah. You know, one of the most amusing remarks that Abhishek and I often get when we ask people to please come and, you know, do something for the museum. Say, you know, I don't have an eye for art. I don't <laughs> understand art. I don't appreciate art. You know, please forgive me, but you know, I'm I don't I don't understand art, so I can't really uh, do much for it. I mean, that is yeah. the most absurd statement I've ever heard. Art is an expression. If you don't know how to express yourself, yep. I think you have to really look inwards and see what's wrong with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, that's because there is not enough dialogue actually. There's not enough communication yeah. about this. So I, so I think this raises yeah. an important point, Sunil, by as to yeah. how we should change this message. Because yeah. I think we are all vested here and we need to play our role in bringing this to the others who may not have experienced it. I think today there's no longer any debate that the left brain and the right brain are two halves of the whole and they need to work together. Yeah. And if the pandemic has not shown this, I don't think anything else would as to how important the arts are, as Kiran said, how much we've consumed it. And possibly it's kept us all mentally stable to whatever extent possible. And the amount we have consumed it at this time. Plus, 21st century skills about design thinking, lateral thinking, creative thinking. I mean, business needs this more than ever before. So what should we be doing to change the narrative? And how should this communication be done? I'd love to hear all three of you on this. So, you want to go first, Firoza? No, go ahead. So, I think it's at multiple levels. Starting from the very start. Starting from the beginning. Exposure at a young age should be as wide as possible. And should not stop in class 3, 4 or 5, as it often tends to. And if you continue, there's enough research, by the way, to show if you expose young people to any specific area, vertical discipline, they tend to, to uh, have a natural affinity for that later in life. And these researches have actually been done uh, with music and theater, etc. I believe uh, we have this very strange relationship with the arts, exactly as we've been discussing. First, arts are all around us. They're in our lives, they're in our homes, they're in our furniture, they're in our curtains, they're literally around us. But just opening that consciousness to be aware of this and appreciating it and reaching out a little bit beyond the, the actual product, I think will make a dramatic difference. But the initiatives like yours, the, the museum that you've set up, I think are very important. Propagating what's going on in there, more private initiatives, and more dynamic government initiatives and more initiatives together between private public partnerships are essential. And they need to bring in corporates and academics and researchers and the lay public. Please don't forget the lay public is the key player and consumer in this. So I think it's, it's important that the language that gets used is easy to understand and allows people then to make their own discovery. If they choose some to want to get deeper and more engaged with something, they can and they should, but at least that opportunities should be there. And that's what we are attempting in our new project to create a, 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 a platform where the arts will speak to the people, not just the object, but it is about people. Thank you. Niran Firozaji. Yeah. So, you know, I feel that, uh, of course, there has to be a very close partnership between private and public, uh, you know, entities. But more than that, I think 
people who are a, you know who are running these institutions these museums they have to have a sense of ownership and passion in in basically running these places what i find most of our museums is it's run by a bunch of people who are just there doing a 9 to 5 job and it cannot be run in a proper way if they if the director of that museum is not so interested in all the treasures that that museum has i've seen certain places being uh, you know run beautifully because the head of that museum is so interested in in what he or she is is dealing with so i think that sense of ownership interest and engagement has to be there in terms of it's all about leadership in everything you do it's about championing something it's about having a sense of ownership and a very inspiring leadership so if you don't find such people then you're not going to be able to do justice to all these places and i just hope that the museums that you know we have all sort of invested in will have that sense of engagement and ownership and, and sunil is absolutely right it has to be inclusive unless you get the larger uh, you know communities interested and excited and inspired by our he heritage and culture i don't think you can really expand the space too much otherwise it will continue to be a challenging space where you will not be able to get the kind of investment you need and it will continue to be that a little above uh, the met kind of uh, investment at a government level it was a ji yeah you know uh, after that i three points basically in the four uh covid has really worked marvels you know i say it at every meeting that i attend that we could never have met our friends across the globe and you've done it abhishek week after week introducing us to scholars from far far plung places and i was astounded we had a lady from nova scotia talking to us on tanka and tanka restoration i mean i could never have brought her to bombay it would have been too expensive i would have been able to manage her visa etc etc but here i was here we all were sitting in our comfort of our homes listening to this fabulous uh, tanka restoration lady so covid has uh, taught us to think differently we should appreciate some silver lining that we have out of this and of course friends across the closer borders nearer india it's been a joy that we can actually have them with us sharing their knowledge and you know who i'm referring to some bureaucrats kiran are extremely inspired because they don't think of their job as a culture secretary or a culture minister or whatever or, or even the head of a museum as a hardship post so we really need to win more friends amongst the administrators the bureaucracy the directors of museums that we are here with you to partner with you and we are not there to take things away from you please let us empower you a little more if we can do that in any way shape or form and i think we will have more inspired people working with us and this left brain right brain i know there are a lot of people here many of you grandparents please encourage your children to learn at least one musical instrument along with their engineering skills because i found if you do medicine and you do violin both parts of your brain develop harmoniously so if you can take up any musical instrument or train your voice if you if the children choirs choirs are blossoming all over the world and they're blossoming in our country too i mean the children are making making music to make you happy and at the top level the great performers of the world are giving up themselves free you don't have to pay for anything so after some time but you know you, you there are certain days between this day and this day when you can hear a wonderful opera or if you're interested in some other for uh, art form aboriginals from uh, uh, canada or australia you can do it so i think both sides of the brain can be developed we'll be better human beings and we'll be healthier human beings too i just want to add to what you know, let, let, let me go i just want to just uh, kiran if you don't mind i'm just making a comment i have to drop off for the next session uh, but he's kiran, back to back so we'll have to allow him to go a few minutes kiran, kiran raised a key point is the passion so amongst the bureaucrats etc we need to figure out who who are the ones because most of these are self starters uh, firoza you said 
the people who have a personal passion for for the arts either they already had it or they got it when they got exposed to it so i think that's that's the key we need to expose more people pick the ones who are passionate to lead the different initiatives i think that will make all of the difference so thank yes, you Abhijay, thank you to, to both of you uh, kiran firoza love this but i'm sorry i have to to no worry, we we pulled you out from your other session so go for that we have a few questions <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Firoza said. I think Sunil also mentioned it. I think this virtual world allows us to appreciate art and anything artistic from any part of the world, and I think we should take full advantage of that. I don't think we would have been able to do this without this wonderful technology. So you can see the symbiosis of technology and art again playing to our strength. So let's take full advantage. Good. Uh, I'm going to give the mic to um, Mr. Sushil Premchand. Sushil, hi. Um, you wanted to ask a question. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I really first want to compliment this panel on I think one of the best panels of the session so far. I did not join at four in the morning like some of you would have started in Indian Standard Time. But I've been at it since uh, early morning by my standards. I think this is by far and away the most interesting, vibrant panel that, that we've experienced so far. To me, the important thing is the message that you've communicated is relevant for many museums in other parts of the world. And I do wish that this can be encapsulated in some way. Uh, a video of this recording would be, I think, invaluable to give to people involved with leadership of museums. I'm fortunate in having uh, in, uh, enthusiastic leaders, knowledgeable leaders of the three museums that I'm closely engaged with and one that I know well, which is yours, Abhishek. I think that all the four museums, the Rietberg Museum, the Photo Museum in Switzerland, the CSMVS in Bombay and MAP, uh, I think are uh, we're fortunate in having in all four situations excellent leadership, uh, knowledgeable leadership. But I think that the underlying problem is of getting people to support these museums in a way that makes sense. And I think, as I said in my comments earlier, education is critical. And this soft power is an intrinsic element of education. And we've ignored it too long. Let me let others have a view, but I just really want to say thank you to all of you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Sushibai. Thank you. We have two more minutes of Kiran Firoza ji. Until we have a question, any closing comments? Well, I, <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just saying that uh, you know, if we don't understand the opportunity and the power of you know of our, of our heritage and culture to leverage and showcase and, and collaborate and really uh, you know create the value exchange with the rest of the world, if we don't understand it now, I don't know when we will understand it. Because I think this is the time for everyone everywhere in the world to understand that it's soft power that actually will save the world. Yeah. And thank heavens this pandemic has made us realize that to some extent. Yes. So that's exactly why we chose the word also. And you know, power is soft power. No, and Abhi, uh, you know, I've been also involved with the Lincoln Center and, and the kind of new thinking that's coming into many of these very famous global institutions is very interesting because they all realize that they have been very sort of cocooned and exclusive and they need to reach out to other parts of the world. So I think every you know museum in the world realizes that this pandemic has taught them that we have excluded people and communities for far too long and that everyone needs to be you know connected in 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 the way we would, we realized the pandemic had connected us but we also need to be very inclusive and there needs to be a great great networking and collaboration around the world so let's really make india the place for the arts and culture and let's all join hands and see what can be done and communicate this to all our colleagues and our peers. Thank you so much. I think we've just finished our session. Thank you all for being here and listening to us. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, Firozaji, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And everybody stay safe and stay well, wherever you may be. Thank you.
We can't be in Kashkai, but this is the next best. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.